Welcome to EPG Pathshala. I'm Dr. Swati Biswas from the Department of Islamic History and Culture, University of Calcutta. Today we are going to discuss from the paper Economic History of India, the module Delhi Sultanate, Urbanization, Its Features and Process. In this module, we are here to learn the reasons for the growth of urban centers and the revival of the older ones, the essential public utility structures in the urban centers, the concept of security and urban space in the medieval times, the role of the slaves in this urban centers and the architectural changes that happened in the urban space. We have to understand that Delhi Sultanate brought about an Islamicate culture into in the subcontinent. And in this Islamicate culture, the concept of urban culture was intricate. The rulers of Delhi Sultanate were essentially urban and the culture that they induced was very urban in this context. Moreover, the increase of the agricultural production during this time led to the increase in the non-agricultural production. The trade and commerce as a result increased. Moreover, the empire itself was expanding and connecting to different places through roads. This in turn gave boost to the development of towns and cities. So therefore, the time was very congenial for an urban space to be created and the urban, earlier urban spaces to revive. We have to understand the Delhi Sultanate, the concept of urbanization changed in the subcontinent and it became at par with the other empires of Asia during that time. Now, this was definitely a time for change. The establishment of Delhi Sultanate paved the way for centralized bureaucracy. The members of the bureaucracy could well be transferred from one part of the state to the other, which never happened in the earlier phase. The process was congenial for the expansion of urban spaces because these, this bureaucracy operated from the urban spaces. The Islamic culture, as I have discussed earlier, also led to the cosmopolitan culture and thus in the caste-based rigid society, this was a new welcome change. The lower caste artisan could inhibit in the heart of the city and they catered to the new urban rich. So this gave a space or rather a scope to social mobility in the caste-driven culture of India. This urbanization further enhanced the mobility of the business class and they started inhabiting in the urban centers which became commercial centers too. So the urban centers not only were the administrative joints but they were commercial centers at the same time where the bureaucracy and the merchants lived side by side and they were served by the artisans and other menial group. The older towns also underwent demographic changes with the advent of the Muslims in those regions. The urbanized Muslims came from diverse lands and this led to further cosmopolitanism. The new technology and instruments were well received in the urban units and again this created a space for the urban mind. The urban culture saw the mingling of the anth anthropocentric and cosmocentric tradition together. The Sufi interaction with the Hindu ascetics further enhanced the cosmopolitanism and paved the way for medieval syncretism, which were urban in its nature. The foreign trade was encouraged by the new rulers. This attitude of the rulers also facilitated the entry of new crafts and technology which changed and modified the indigenous crafts. It is important to probe into the factors that led to this urbanization and how this again changed the social and economic life during this period. Now let us move to the institutions of public uh, utility. One such institution was the Khanka. Uh, the different institutions of public utility helped the development of old towns which in medieval times served as the 
provincial headquarters and centers of trade along with culture. And one such institution was the Khanka or what would definitely mean in the dictionary term, the lodge. The Khanka was also known as Ribat in Arabic and Persian until the 11th century. The Khanka served as a resting place for travelers, scholars and Sufi saints. The concept that it only got attached to the term Sufis was much, much later. We have to understand the 10th, in the 9th, 10th, 11th and 12th century, the Sufis were always on the move and moved to urban centers from one urban center to the other and rested in these khankas. The wazir would also ask the people to gather in these khanka and asked about their demand. That this was a very common practice where the high bureaucracy would call the common people in these khankas. This place served various purposes and was an essential feature of the city life. And khanka usually was placed in the middle of an urban center. The philanthropists of India would also sponsor the construction of khankas for the travelers outside India. The charge of the Khanka was usually given to a trustworthy man. So all these religious activities would go around a Khanka. The Khankas and the urban conquest were therefore not a Supi hospice as it is believed. It is an urban institution of public utility to provide accommodation to travelers, free food and also distribute money and stipends to the deserving people. The maintenance of it was usually by, done by the state of wealthy people. Sometimes revenue of certain villages were assigned to this purpose. The contemporary writing suggests that the Khankas were built by the state while the Ribat was built by the travelers. But of course this clear-cut mark was not always there. The shops and houses which were built around uh, this place would, uh, and the income of it would be used for the upkeep of this place. The tradition of building khankas as well was well established by none other than the founder of Delhi Sultanate, that is Kutubuddin Aibak, and it was soon followed by all his successors. Now, in the account of Ibn Battuta, we get the information that the khankas were looked after by Sheikh ul Islam. The state charity in kind and cash would be passed on to the needy and the deserving travelers and holy men through this official. The good number of villages would be attached to the Khanka and the revenue would go to the Khankas for the maintenance. The traveler himself made the Sheikh ul Islam of Amroha during his visit. This place later was the headquarters of the province with the same name. In his account, he says the uh, man was very popular for his piety. He also writes about the city of Dhar. Uh, according to the city of Dhar, the Khanka was again built here. It was situated on a hillock on a very big and spacious space. The income from the city of Dhar and its adjoining place would go to this Khanka. Its charge was entrusted to Sheikh, someone called Sheikh Ibrahim Malbibi, who was, of course, a Sufi saint who immigrated to India. A Manakib ul Asifa by Shos Fardosi informs that Khanka of Bihar. Sharif was looked after by Sheikh Sharafuddin Yaha, the celebrated Sufi saint of the Firdosi sect. Mohammed Min Tughlaq appointed some Bukhari Jahanani Jagashat as the Sheikh ul Islam of Punjab and Sindh. He looked after 40 such Khankas in Sindh and southern Punjab. All these people somehow were linked to the Sufi order. Firoz Tughlaq surpassed these predecessors in undertaking projects like building of khankas, madrashas and darul shifa or hospitals when the endowments are for public welfare. The nobles and ro royal women also contributed money for the maintenance of this khanka for, uh, for religious merits. Now, 
this khanqas, of course, sometimes would also be treated as places which were controlled by the Sufi saints. And later, at the end of the Sultanate period, of course, these places were strictly attached to the Sufi orders. Now, let us move to another important public utility space, that is the Sarai. The Sarai was a very urban feature which did not exist perhaps before the advent of the Delhi Sultanate in the way it did during that time. This building was essentially urban and the trace of it was not found in villages. The process of urbanization of any place would include the existence of this building and was the next best public utility feature. Interestingly, in the writing of Ziauddin Barani, the term Sarai has led to such misconception among historians. It gave the impression that Sarai were a mere inns meant for the stay of the wayfarers, which actually it was not. In the 13th-14th century, the term Sarai referred to the royal palaces or the building of wealthy people. Thus, Sheikh Nizamuddin Aulia refers to the place of Sultan Iltutmish as Sarai Sultani as informed in Fawad ul Fuad. Outside India, before the foundation of Delhi Sultanate, any place, palace or building belonging to wealthy people were referred as Sarai Sultani, Sarai Wazir or Sarai Amir e Dad. This corroborated in the Malfuzat literature of Sheikh Nasiruddin Chirag e Delhi. The change of the meaning of the term seems to have been sipping in from the 15th and 16th century when Sarai became the caravan inns for the merchants. Sultan Sikandar Lodi is reported to have built such a sarai at Mathura according to Waki Ati Mushtaki by Sheikh Rizk, Rizkaullah Mushtaki. It is supposedly the first reference to caravan sarai during Delhi Sultanate. But of course, apart from this record, we do not have any other record corroborating this fact. Sher Shah Sur is accredited to build, build highways and constructing sarais at an interval of 8 miles, at least uh, what we know from the sources of this period. It is believed that he had built almost 1,700 sarais. The sarais had separate quarters for Hindus and Muslims. Provision of food to the travelers and livestock was made in the sarais at the cost of the state at times, but of course, these costs were also met by the merchants themselves. The security of the place was ensured sometimes by placing the thanas or the police stations beside it. Now, this is very interesting to note that one public utility space led to the other public utility space during this time. At times, royal buildings were also constructed near certain sarais for the stay of the royalty. The shikdars or the local officers of military rank were posted as officers in, these, in charge of these places. These sites developed in two townships later in course of time as businessmen and wage laborers flocked to these places to settle down. So in one way, the public utility spaces were spaces that were created in the urban center. And on the other hand, these public sp uh, utility spaces could again give an enhanced urban space uh, on the other hand. Now, leading to, from uh, Sarai's, one would lead to uh, the, uh, the third public utility space, the Thanas. Now, the concept of security and the state ensured security became very important during Delhi Sultanate. The other institutions which developed uh, during, the, uh, during this period along with uh, the, the Sarais and the Khankas was Thana. The first reference to Thana was made by Ziauddin Barani in his Tariqi Feroz Shahi and it refers to the time of Yasuddin Balban. 
It is referred at a place that was built in the regions near highway for the upkeep of law and order. So therefore initially thanas were placed near the highways and not in the heart of the city. Isami and Barani refers also to the thanas named Deopalgir near Delhi to keep the Mawati bandits at bay. We have to understand that these Mawati bandits operated in the highways. Both appreciated the effort of the state. A number of thanas were built in and around Delhi for the upkeep of law and order. Now, this altogether gave a different flavor to the urban pattern during that time. The concept of business and security ensured by the state with organized police system was a general feature of the urban pattern of this time. The building of thanas in most urban centers were completed by mid 15th century and we have to understand that this network of thanas continued till the time of the Mughals when they took over and built these thanas again. The newly cleared uh, Doab region also had thanas because it was a potentially economic area. Now, Barani informs the Jalali in the district of Aligarh and Kampil Patiali, the Shamsabad and Bhagwan Gun, all in the Doab region had thanas. Each of the thanas had Afghan garrisons. Mosque and Badrathas were also built near the thanas, which again became a feature of these urban spaces. This definitely had a great civilizing impact on the society on a whole. It may be assumed that by the end of 15th century, every thana developed into an important township acquiring the status of a Pargana headquarters, which is a lower unit of the administrative system. They also provided market facilities to the peasants of the village around these towns. So it is again because of the thanas that organized markets could develop. The Thana of Campbell during Alauddin Khalji acquired so much importance that a fortress had to be developed there. Ibn Battuta called it the most impregnable fort in the region of Dwab. Another Thana worth mentioning is Afghanpur close to Amroha and the headquarters of the new province unit near Katehar. This town exists even today in the thick districts of Muradabad known as Agvanpur. In the subsequent period, these thanas were built along highways in the remote areas. It is noted that Sikandar Shah Lodi had built thanas in Chambal areas to keep dacoits at bay. One such thana was also built in Hatkant, which developed into an important township during uh, Sheh Shah Sur. Around 12,000 Tarin Afghans were evacuated from Sirhind to be settled in the town of Harkant and thus the local elites had to become law abiding in this area. Now, with the thanas developing and the markets de developing along with it, the concept of security was equated with urban spaces. The concept of security was an essential feature of the urban process. The trade and commerce was conducted in these urban centers. The money that was in circulation was shared not only by the merchants but also by the political rulers. Thus security of the urban centers were a prime concern of the rulers and the merchants alike. It is not something new in the subcontinent, but the concept of organized security through centrally controlled thanas and the officially uh, designated security in an organized fashion was definitely new and unique in the subcontinents. This was further developed even during the time of the Mughals. The Thanas and Kakankas helped the process of urbanization and the bazaars therein encouraged the peasants of nearby villages to raise cash crops and prosper 
in consequences. So we have to understand that this network of urban space also facilitated the trade and commerce and trade and commerce on the other hand facilitated these uh, the process of urbanization during this period. The local elites now came in contact with the civil law established by the center and thus their lifestyle changed. A general change ushered in the mindset where the town became the attracting space and provided alternative employment to aspiring people from the rural area. The rural elites now wore clothes which were owned by the urban elite and they rode trained horses as a marker of social prestige. So, so therefore, urban culture became the marker of elite culture. The urban centers, in the urban centers, the role of the slaves is also very important to note. We have to understand that medieval, during the medieval period, slave trade throughout Asia and even in Europe was very important. The concept of slavery had a different denomination or rather a different kind of a meaning in the medieval period. The slaves were also considered at part of the affluent culture. The slaves brought from different countries contributed the progress of the material culture and introduced fine arts. Investment for a slave training and education fetched higher prices. Isami mentions about the Chinese slaves who were painters and known as Nakshgaran i Chin, bought by the Sultan Iltutmish to paint his palace. The foreign slaves were brought to serve in the army and give other services when were considered to be very royal. And especially during the time of Iltutmish up to Balban, slaves were part of the highest bureaucracy. Their presence in any urban center was also marked feature of these towns. Slave girls were trained with finer attributes and had great demand in the market. The poets during this period highly praised these slave girls for their accomplishments. The capital of Delhi along with Lahore emerged as the core of the urban ethos of Delhi Sultanate. But also this is another feature that the capital always becomes the marker of culture in the medieval urban or Islamicate culture. So there is always a tendency of the towns nearby to imitate the culture of the center. This perhaps was the reason as to why Lahore was ransacked by the Mongols so many times. The resistance that was put up by the officials and the citizens was also a marked feature of the urban psychology of the medieval period. Like any other town in the Islamicate world in particular and medieval town in general, the concept of being attacked by outsiders was very common and the mindset was set in a way where the residents would save their own urban spaces. The cities were mostly had garrison walls because these garrison walls were built not only by the state but by the merchants for their own security. The defense of the towns was the responsibility of the officials as well as the citizens therefore. During the Lahore attack, the Mongols took away the women and the children as booty. But again, this was a common feature during medieval times and these women and children would again go back to the slave trade. This was a common feature not only in the Indian subcontinent but of the other parts of Asia. Lahore could only come back to its glory during the time of the Lodhis. So again from this incidence of Lahore we can understand that our urban center would go up and down in its cultural fates during this time depending on the amount of uh, trade and commerce that was happening in this area. The Delhi Sultanate saw the emergence of Delhi in the north and Dalaptabad in the south as a two nucleus of urban ethos with very very different atypical regional characters along with 
uh, another, another urban center that is Sonargaon in Bengal. It is true that there was regional difference among these cities, but since the civil law and order more or less had the same feature, the cultural ethos had something in common. Moreover, the urban centers were linked by trade, which could then bring the uniformity of material culture, at least for the urban elite of uh, this time and create an urban pattern that would be intricately uh, 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 significance of this period. The urban centers developed a cosmopolitan fervor as different people from different countries and different parts of the empire with different culture flocked to these places. The concept of cosmopolitanism and urbanity also is a marked feature of the medieval times. The nobility, madrasa, hospices, and Jamaat Khawas or Darul Shifa or hospitals, bazaar, and the royal court were the agents of change, therefore, of this period. Now, let us look into the architectural change. The, the introduction of Islam in this part of the land, as we have discussed, introduced the Islamicate culture. The architecture of the urban centers also went through a sea change. The architectural pattern change giving the urban centers an Islamicate look, which widely praised by the travelers and noted in their account. City became a mixture of the accurate system of Islamicate world of West and an indigenous feature. The arch and dome became the marked feature of these North Indian towns. The masons here conveniently built corbel domes initially instead of perfect ones as these were easier to make and less time consuming. Now this was mostly constructed in the 13th century and were con comparatively shallow and less durable. The services of the architects as masons having this perfect knowledge perhaps was from the mid 13th century. The writings of Ziauddin Barani confirms the existence of perfect dome in Bhatner and Bhatinda in the mid 14th century. The slaves from different countries of West Asia also came as masons. Moreover, the indigenous masons got new ideas from the foreign counterparts. The architects also used these masons to create architecture which represented the mood of the time and also fixed the features essentially to the time and political culture. Eventually, an agric architectural pattern that could certainly be claimed to have its own genre was established. The use of lime and mortar in a large scale revolutionized this process of building the urban sector. The process soon reached South India as the political activities conducted by from Delhi. To summarize, uh, it is important to note that the public utility space along with the psychological balance of the merchants in the state led to the, form, to the creation of an Islamicate culture of the urban space which could be called essentially a smart feature of this empire. To, so to summarize this whole module, we can say that the new rulers brought about the Islamicate culture of urbanity to India, the technological change and the agricultural surplus brought about a change in the industrial sector and in turn led to the growth of the urban centers. The empire itself was congenial for the process. The medieval concept of public, public utility space also was responsible for the growth of urban centers. Overall, the era favored the growth of the city life and economic activity went side by side. Thank you for your patience listening and for further reference you can go back to the e-text with the module. Thank you.